It's a great job. He's been a tremendous supporter. Go ahead, finish it up, right? <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for being here. It's wonderful people, wonderful state. We've had great luck in the state, and uh, I think we're really putting it back. I'm very close, I have to tell you, to pulling off something that you've been looking forward to for many years, and that's the 12-month uh, E-15 waiver. We're getting very close to doing it. It's a very complex process. And I stuck with ethanol, and most other candidates were uh, — they weren't there, right, to put, it, to put it mildly. But Kim and uh, Terry Branstad, who's uh, Right now, you're a great ambassador to China. Right. We could not have put him in a more auspicious location or a more important location from the standpoint that Terry is out there doing a, a really a, not an easy job. But I think in the end, it's going to work out very well. It's going to be uh, it's going to be something special. I want to thank Secretary Wilbur Ross for being here. Secretary Alex Acosta. Wilbur, Alex. <laughs> Governor Kim Reynolds, uh, I guess one of the reasons I liked Terry, you know, he was the longest-serving governor in the history of the United States, I think 24 years. And uh, he was sort of semi-newly elected again. And I said, uh, how about this? Let's see. First, I had to figure out who is the — who is the lieutenant governor? And I knew it was Kim, and I said, you know, she'll be a great governor. She's turned out to be better than a great governor. You have — you know, and Rod told me that. I said, Rod, how is she doing? And he said, she's phenomenal, right? Absolutely. She said, she's phenomenal, and she really has been. You're number one in almost every category. You're in the top three in jobs. You're in the top three in employment. You're number one state. I think they just came out. <laughs> number one state. Those are uh, — that's right. Those are very bad sound bites for whoever you're running against. I don't know who you're, I don't know who you're running against, but I can tell you, that's not easy. When they rate you number one state for uh, a lot of things, especially uh, on an economic basis, the job you're doing, Kim, has been fantastic. And I can tell you, I spoke to Terry recently. We speak a lot, and he thinks you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you, we thank you very much. And. And also sitting up here with Rod Blum. Uh, without him, we wouldn't have. <laughs> without Rod, we wouldn't have our tax cuts, and we have massive tax cuts and reform. I don't mention reform because nobody's too complicated to talk about. People talk about tax cuts. We didn't want to use the word reform, but the reform's a very important thing, what we did. And even included in that bill is the individual mandate. We got rid of the individual mandate, the most unpopular thing in Obamacare, and Obamacare is on its way out. You look at the cost of Obamacare, it's horrible. In fact, it was done, except we had one man that decided at the, you know, late in the evening uh, that he would change his vote. Isn't that wonderful? So he changed his vote, and he surprised all of us. But it was dead. But it's virtually uh, — it's, it's on its last legs right now. Uh, Alex Acosta has come up with uh, incredible health care plans through the Department of Labor, association plans where you associate, where you have groups and you go out and you get tremendous health care at a very small cost. And it's across state lines. You can compete all over the country. They compete. They want to get it. And, Alex, I hear it's like record business that they're doing. We just opened about two months ago, and I'm hearing that the numbers are incredible. Numbers of people that are getting really, really good health care instead of Obamacare, which is a disaster. So you're getting great health care for uh, really a fraction of the cost, highly competitive, costs the United States government nothing, and yet you're getting much better health care, and it's at very small prices. So I want to thank you. The job you did on that is incredible. Now he's doing phase two, and that's going to be announced very shortly, and that's going to be a very big group of people that nobody even knows about. That's right. And then Secretary Azar also is uh, doing a different form of health care that's turning out to be incredible. We're working very hard on uh, — medicine prices. You probably saw where Pfizer actually uh, announced a price increase, and then they — we weren't happy, and they took it away. They took it away. It's never happened before. And I thank Pfizer for that. I thank them.
And Merck, likewise, and, and uh, Novartis, and a number of — they announced uh, increases. And, uh, boy, I must have a very powerful position, Wilbur, because I — I act — I was extremely angry about it. And then all of a sudden, they all called, we're going to retract our price increases. So I said, number one, that has to be a good business. Otherwise, you don't do that. And number two, I appreciate that they did it. But we're working very hard on getting prescription uh, drugs down and prices down. And we have a, a big — that's what upset me. Here we are talking about you know, bringing down the prices of prescription drugs. And you had a couple of companies go out and announce an increase. And uh, now uh, those prices are going to become really tumbling down. Uh, we have something else that we did, uh, Right to Try. And you would really uh, — you would you were so instrumental in that, Rod, and I appreciate it. You and Greg and everybody. But uh, I've been after it for a long time. I never understood it. They've been trying to get it passed for 42 years. You know what Right to Try is? It's actually a great title. You know, a lot of these names I don't like. I love this name, Right to Try. And this is where people are terminally ill, and they can't get a drug that shows great promise because the company or because the country says, well, we don't want to let anybody have a drug that's going to maybe hurt them. Well, they're terminally ill, so they want the right to try it. And they'll travel if they have the money, and most of the people don't have the money, so they literally — they have no hope. But this way, you have these incredible drugs that are coming out. It's too early in the stage to let them go out to the mass public. Many of them are going to work. But even if it was some of them are going to work, you now have the right to try. So you now have the right to get these drugs. And I think it's going to be a fantastic thing. And Rod Blum and, and uh, some of the other folks have really been instrumental. That was an important one for Rod, but it was an important one for a lot of people. And incredible how difficult it was. I mean, you would think that would be an easy one, right? What's easier than that? But the drug companies didn't like it because it showed badly, because people were very, very sick. They didn't want it in their statistics. The insurance companies didn't want it because they didn't want to get sued. The states didn't want it because there was a liability question. And we got them all in a room. We said, look, everybody will sign a document saying we're going to take this and we're going to take away all liability. No suits, no nothing, but we're going to have the right to try. And they said, I was there. I guess I you could say I let it. And they said, they said very nicely, oh, well, that works. Everybody said that works. You know, in terms of uh, the statistics for the drug companies, and I understood, they don't want to have that as a bad stat, because these people were really far down the line in many cases. I said, we won't count that stat. Or we'll have a different set of statistics where it's terminally ill people. But one of the things you do get out of it is you really will find out whether or not it works. But the thing that we wanted to get was we wanted to give people hope. And that's what they got. So that was something that was really good. And I'm, I'm just mentioning because Rod was so helpful with that and so many other things. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I also want to thank the Northeast Iowa Community College President, Dr. Liang Chi Wei, for hosting us. Very good. And uh, really fantastic what we saw. We met some of the students, and uh, they're really enthusiastic, and they're going to have a great life. They're going to have a great life. You know, we have so many companies moving back to the United States now, and what we need is talented people, people that have knowledge and people that know how to use those incredible machines that you don't learn overnight, right? And uh, what you're doing here is a great example. A lot of people are studying it what you're doing in Iowa with Kim and everybody else. And you were very complimentary of your governor, and I, I understand that. But what you're doing is really incredible. People all over the country and beyond the country are studying what you're doing right here in Iowa, Kim. And thank you, doctor, very much. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, a person who was actually a very, very good student, she went to the Wharton School of Finance, and she was always a great student. I said, Ivanka, are you going to do your homework? Yeah, I've already done it, Dad. And then she get A's. I said, she doesn't work. She doesn't work. And I remember when she graduated from Wharton, she did very well. And her friend said, you know, we had to work harder than she did. And uh, I don't know if they were happy or not, but they liked her. Everybody likes Ivanka. But she really led this initiative so much, and she continues to. She feels it's so important to job training. Uh, we have, again, we have so many companies coming into this area, but all over the country. 
And the biggest problem we have is we have to have people with talent and skill. Otherwise, we're not going to have these companies come in. But we are learning, and we're, we're, uh, we're teaching a lot of people, and they're great people. And Ivanka really has been leading that initiative. And I want to thank you very much. Thank really you. fantastic. Thank you. Ivanka, before we begin, maybe you just might want to tell them about the bill that was passed last night. Absolutely. So after many, many years, since 2006, Congress on both sides of the aisle could not get together to reauthorize and modernize a piece of legislation that is so critically important to what we're all here talking about, career and technical education. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act passed the Senate last week passed the House this week and will be signed into law by the President after over a decade of languishing. It's Unless I don't sign it. I don't Maybe I'll veto it. Maybe I'll veto it. I'll see. Let's see. I think I'll veto that bill. What do you think? Uh, don't. No, no, no. It's going to affect 11 million students and workers across the nation who are seeking to acquire the technical skills to be able to thrive in our modern and increasingly digital economy. So it is very, very exciting. And That's it's so an good. enormous piece of legislation. And it's going to be really transformative to education across the country. And I was actually here in Iowa just this past March with, uh, with the great governor, uh, Reynolds, and we toured one of the facilities that benefits from Perkins. This facility benefits from Perkins, and it's great legislation that was in dire need of being modernized. So thanks to the president's leadership and thanks to the push of the White House, um, it got done. So we're very excited and won't be signed into law. Good. Good. So, Rod, get that to my desk, right? Get that to my desk, all right? Please. You can sign it, right? Before I change my mind. It. I'll change my mind. Be careful. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you very much. But I want to also send our prayers to the communities who have been affected by the recent uh, devastating tornadoes in central Iowa. That was uh, all over the news, and I watched it. I love this place. It's been a very special place to me. And uh, you know what? Whatever we can do, we're doing. We have a lot of federal people out here, some incredible people, and uh, they're all working with your your representatives, and I know uh, they're doing the best they can. But I will tell you, that's a terrible event. It's uh, tragic. The power, the power of nature. People have no idea. Moments ago, I toured the school's amazing state-of-the-art training lab with the doctor, and uh, preparing, really, they're preparing American students for the work of the future, for their life's future, and they're going to have a great living. They're going to be making a great living. Uh, they're sought after. They're really sought after, and I congratulated them. We're making tremendous progress on workforce uh, development. Next week, I'll sign the legislation that Ivanka just talked about that is going to be uh, really something and uh, really an amazing achievement. Between that and, you know, for years, how many years, Ivanka, they've been working Since in that? 2006. Yeah, 2006. But we're signing one for the vets. Uh, choice. That's been up for 44 years. They've been trying to get choice, where you wait in line for weeks and weeks and weeks. You're not even very sick. And by the time you get to see the doctor, you have a terminal illness. They could have taken care of it very easily if you got early. But weeks and weeks, and we got choice. And, uh, People said you couldn't do that, and we got it. That's where you go out and you see a doctor, and the country pays. These are our vets. The country pays the doctor's bill, which is a tiny fraction of the cost of what would happen and what has been happening. And uh, the lines are being reduced so drastically, and the vets are now able, if they can't see, if they can't get immediate service, they go right outside, they get a doctor, a local doctor. We have deals worked and pricing worked and everything worked, and they get taken care of. It's really great. And we also passed accountability. And, you know, in the, vet, in the VA, you couldn't fire anybody. You knew that. This man knew it better than anybody. He's a tough cookie. He wanted to, if they don't take care of our vets, you yes. want them out. And what happened is uh, you couldn't get it. It was 45 years they've been trying to get accountability. Now, of course, the unions weren't thrilled. And the uh, civil service, you know, was difficult. Uh, and that would be the stumbling block. That's why they couldn't get it passed, and we got it passed, VA accountability. So if they don't treat our vets right, we look at them and we say, sorry, you're fired. Get out. 
out, out, out. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really, to me, that's a big one. And what you did last night, I mean, that's only been from early 2000, so that's uh, easy by comparison. But we, those two bills for the VA, for the vets, was uh, just incredible. We're really doing a job with the vets, I think. It, it's never been like this before. But I, I believe that both of them, but in particular choice, is going to be it's going to make such a difference where i mean they were waiting for weeks just to see a doctor and then they'd have to come back for a second visit and it would be four weeks later and horrible so we took care of that whether a citizen's a high school student or a mid to late career worker we want americas of americans of all ages and backgrounds to be equipped with the skills they need to thrive preparing american workers for american jobs we've added 3.7 million jobs since, as you know, uh, since the election. That was a great election. Wasn't that a great election? Yeah. And I have to say, because we have a lot of farmers in this place, we had this hat made up. Look at that. It's, awesome. it's the John Deere colors, actually. But make our farmers great again. Isn't that great? Make our And yesterday, you know, we've been working on these trade deals, which are the worst ever made by any country in history. We had the worst trade deals. We don't have one trade deal that's any good. Between NAFTA, which was a horrible deal, and we're getting close on that, but we're making it good. Uh, you're dealing with closed markets. The Canadians, uh, you have a totally closed market from uh, so many. You know, in Canada, they have a 375 percent tax on dairy products. Other than that, it's wonderful to deal. And we have a very big deficit with Canada, trade deficit, although they don't like to say that. But on one of their pieces of paper that they give out with the Canadian flag, and I love Canada, by the way, I have to tell you, I love Canada. But they have the Canadian flag very official. It says $97.8 billion deficit that the United States has, or they put it down as a surplus to Canada. And I said, well, if we're doing so well with Canada, how come it's 98.7 billion dollars, okay? That's a lot of money. And uh, so we're opening things up. But the biggest one of all happened yesterday, other than China. The EU, the European, the thing called Europe. Europe. And uh, the relationship with Jean-Claude, who's the, uh, the head, who's a, actually a very, very strong guy, very tough guy, but a good man. And he's done an incredible job pulling all the countries together. But we just opened up Europe for you, farmers. You're not going to be too angry with Trump, I can tell you, because you were, you were essentially, wouldn't you say, Kim, you, they were restricted from yeah, dealing in Europe. You had barriers that really made it impossible for farm products to go in. And I said to him, do me a favor. Will you just, because, you know, China's doing a little number, they want to attack the, the farm belt because they know those, the farmers love me, they voted for me, we won every one of the states, and you look at that middle of this country, outside of a little, a little bit of blue on the outs outer edges of the country, we won just everything. And uh, so they figured, oh, what we'll do is we'll attack them. And I see that, and I said, they're not going to win, just so you understand. We have all the cards, we're going to win. But it's not nice what they're doing. But I said to the Europeans, I said, do me a favor, would you go out to the farms in Iowa and all the different places in the Midwest? Would you buy a lot of soybeans right now? Because what, that whole soybean thing is now going to be opened up. No tariffs, no nothing, free trade. I call it free and fair. See, that's called free trade. When you have a country that's charging you 50 percent tariffs and we charge them nothing, and then I raise it to 50 percent, and then we have politicians in Washington say, we are stopping free trade. No, no. They stopped it when they put on the 50 percent. I mean, we have countries that are charging us 200 percent, 250 percent, 100 percent. I don't want to mention them because I actually get along very well with the uh, head people. But they know who they are, and they're changing their ways. But the Europe uh, — I mean, basically, we opened up Europe. And that's going to be a great thing for Europe, and it's been really going to be a great thing for us. And it's going to be a really great thing for our farmers, because you have just — gotten yourself one big market that really essentially, wouldn't you say, Kim, never existed because you just had you just had a problem. So um, we did that yesterday afternoon. We signed a, uh, a letter of intent or agreed to a letter of intent, and we're starting the documents. But the relationship is very, very good. So we're very happy. 
And then the employers are hiring and they're recruiting and they're raising wages in our country. And you know what's happened. We have so many jobs now coming in, but they're raising wages. The first time that's happened in 19 years where wages are going up. Now, you're a couple of people, you own your big farms, you probably don't hear that, but you're doing okay. So you're doing okay. But it's the first time that's happened in a long time. And uh, we're just doing really, really well as a country. And uh, there's no place doing better than Iowa. I mean, there's no place with better leadership. There's no place with more advanced thought. And I want to thank — I want to thank your governor. And, uh, you know, as I sort of alluded, when I — when I put Terry uh, as the ambassador, such an important position. And he really likes China. He really likes China. Very interesting story. Terry told me, he said, you know, many years ago, like 38 years ago, he met a man named Xi. And he came back because he was selling corn to China. And he came back and told his incredible wife, who is incredible, with, by the way, a son who led my campaign. I don't know if he's here. Where is he? Is he here? Because what a great guy. I hope he's working on your campaign and your campaign. But he came back and he told his wife, this is, I think, 38 years before, he said, I just met the future head of China. And she said, what do you mean? I just met a man who's so impressive that he will someday be the head of China. And that's President Xi. He just got — in fact, I guess he's president for life, based on everything I've heard. <laughs> but — but can you imagine Terry Branstad told me that story, which was a great story. So I want to ask uh, Kim to say a few words, and then maybe we can travel around the table real fast. We'll all say something. But it's great to be in Iowa. We had a tremendous victory here. We won by a lot. And uh, just very, very special people. Very, very special. And we're taking care of your ethanol, okay? Nobody else was going to, believe me. They were out. They were out. We're taking care of your ethanol, right? And, and before, I have to thank uh, Senator Grassley has been an incredible friend of mine. Joni Ernst has been — Joni has been, like, an incredible friend of mine, although I think she likes Ivanka better than she likes me. <laughs> it's the same thing. Girl power, right? But like Joni you. Ernst, I'll tell you, she's a tremendous talent. Uh, Chuck Grassley is, like — he's Chuck Grassley. He's just incredible. He speaks and you listen, right? There's no games with Chuck. But uh, they've been pushing me very, very strong on the ethanol. And, you know, we've been with them all the way. So I just want to thank them. I know they're in Washington doing some very important business right now, but I want to thank them. Kim, go ahead. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, first I want to say welcome back to Iowa. It's a pleasure to have you back in our state. I also want to welcome back Ivanka and Secretary Acosta as well. Uh, we appreciate the time that you've spent in Iowa really seeing what we've been working on. And it's a real pleasure to be a part of this round table to discuss the importance of workforce. And I think we're actually the first state that you've stopped at to Correct. do the pledge since the executive order was assigned. So thank you. We're really proud of our leadership role on this front. And really, the public-private partnerships uh, continue to build the foundation. So many of the businesses that I see out in the audience today have been such a phenomenal partner with our schools and our communities and our community colleges to really help build those partnerships to help not only young people see that there are so many pathways to a great career, but as we saw on the tour, adults that are reskilling, retraining, and having a great opportunity to have a great career and a great quality of life, and most importantly, right here in the state of Iowa. So I love the relationships that are being built through initiatives like the one that you're driving. Um, we have an initiative called, it's called Future Ready Iowa, and the goal is to have 70% of um, Iowans in the workforce have either education or training beyond high school. By the year 2025, we're at about 58% right now, so we're really positioned very well, I think, to hit that goal. But it just aligns so well with everything that you're doing. Uh, we're doing Last Dollar Scholars, which is some financing for credentials up to two-year degrees tied to high-demand jobs, an employer innovation fund that really strengthens the regional talent partnerships and the talent pipeline. Again, different areas need different things, and so this really helps the areas identify where, and, and, and work on where their need is at. Um, we're expanding registered apprenticeship programs for smaller and mid-sized businesses, so that's really exciting too. And we're doing a lot of work-based learning. We have, a, it's called the um, STEM Best Initiative, which is uh, business engaging student and teachers. It's been phenomenal, again, um, with really bringing 
um, workforce and academia together in a partnership. They were operating in silos, so it's been great to see that. The other thing that we're putting in place is a clearinghouse so that we can provide work-based learning opportunities to some of our rural communities that might not have the access to the great opportunities, and we want to make sure that no matter where you live in the state of Iowa, you have opportunities. I'll tell one quick story, and then I'll pass it because we, we want to hear from the other people on the panel. But it's really about kids like um, Charles Vander Velden, and uh, he is from Pella, and he is the first ever high school student to become a registered apprentice in welding with Vermeer, who is a great company in Pella that happened to be hit uh, with the tornado. And I tell you, they're coming back bigger and stronger than ever. So again, great community efforts there. But they unveiled a high school registered apprenticeship playbook that high schools all across this the state can take it and really use it for welding or computer science or IT or nursing, whatever that may be. And we've made it very, very simple to really encourage our schools across the state to engage with our community colleges, our businesses, uh, and, and our students. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Thanks for signing the executive order. We appreciate the partnership. Great. And uh, we're taking advantage of your tax reform, too, because That's we right. were able to pass tax reform in the state of Iowa, as well as regulatory reform. So uh, we're partnering with you on a lot of great initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much. Is that, is that the home of Pella Windows, too? Pella? Yes, it is. I bought a lot of Pella Windows. <laughs> <laughs> And I bought a lot of John Deere equipment, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of John Deere equipment, one of their bigger customers, they tell me. So that's good. And, and Pella makes a great window, I will say that. They make a really great window, so we'll go around. Yes. Mr. President, uh, Beth Townsend, Director of Iowa Workforce Development. First and foremost, I want to say, as a, as a veteran, thank you to your administration for everything you have done for veterans. You just don't know what that has meant to, to all of us. Thank so you. thank you. I also wanted to say I've heard you talk about the dignity of work, which is something we in Iowa really believe in. And when you combine that with our employers who believe in investing in their employees, and you bring the collaboration and the great leadership that we've had from Governor Reynolds and Governor Branstead and create programs like Future Ready Iowa, you want to know how to solve this problem in America? You look at us, and we will tell you how to do it. Good. I know that. That's true. <laughs> Doctor, would you like to say a few words, please? Um, again, on behalf of Northeast Iowa Community College, welcome to everybody. It's not every day we get the President of the United States here, so Mr. President, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you for really looking at the Perkins uh, legislation. In fact, I just read it this morning under the leadership of Representative Virginia Fox. It says, one of the priorities is to have more inclusive collaboration but between educational institution, industry, employers, and community partners. Mr. President, we're already doing it in Iowa, and the 15 community colleges backing by our governor, we're doing it. From the K-12, getting them into guided pathways so that they understand that education has to be a purpose. Our focus is career readiness and also college readiness. And when they come to us, we make sure that we get them to be the skill and partnering with our businesses to make sure that they apply them. 85% of our students live, work, and play in Northeast Iowa. We cover 5,000 square miles. So we're keeping Iowans in Iowans, and we're keeping jobs here. Last year alone, we worked with over 470 businesses and trained over 1,000 employees. In fact, last year, we touched over 20,000 for upskilling. So you find that as a community college, we really are the college of the people. And we welcome you back again because today you only saw a sliver of what we yeah, do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I can't Very thank enough though. our business partners out here, they're out here. Without their support, without our K-12 support, without the state support, without the city, city council and, and all the other government, Northeast Iowa Community College would not be able to do what you have set up, and that is... Americans to work. We're fully behind that, and under the governor's leadership, we'll make sure that that happens. And that 70 percent, Madam Governor, we're going to exceed that. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to maybe have uh, Matt Blum speak next because 
he's been so incredible in so many ways. He fights so hard. He loves his state. He loves the people. I guess he's got a race against somebody they call Absent Abby because she never showed up to the State House. I don't know what's going on. Absent Abby. Who is Absent Abby? But he's going to, you're going to, have you ever heard that term? I think so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he came to me recently with, uh, that's a bad name for somebody to have if you're running for office, I'll tell you. But he came to me recently uh, about a flood wall. And uh, that's a big deal, isn't it, huh? Big deal. And, big got, deal. and how much Thank money? Much. How much money did you get? One hundred and seventeen million. One hundred and seventeen million dollars. And if somebody else would have come, they wouldn't have got. They would have gotten two dollars. <laughs> but he got one hundred and seventeen million dollars, uh, and it's going well, Thank right? Is you. it going well? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Congratulations. Well. Thank you very and, much. Uh, good luck with everything, and I appreciate everything. I appreciate your help. You've Thank been you, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Say a few words, please. Mr. President, Ivanka. Labor Secretary Acosta and uh, Commerce Secretary Ross, welcome to the 1st District of Iowa. And uh, I don't mean to put the pressure, Mr. President, on Secretary Ross, because I know he's got a lot in his plate, but we made a bet in Air Force One on the way out here, a steak dinner, correct, Mr. Secretary, right. on getting a deal done with Mexico in the next 90 days. That's right. Correct? Yes. And I fully plan on buying you a steak dinner. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership on our economy. We are now growing at over twice the rate, twice the rate that we were under former President Obama, and it's due in large part to your leadership. Thank you very much for that, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you so and also, thank you for having political courage to renegotiate these trade deals which, quite frankly, are not good to the United States. And you've taken some heat for it in the short term. Short but term. in the long run, the farmers, the manufacturers, the employers are all going to be better That's off. Right. Thank you for having That's political right. courage. That's right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And lastly, thank you for our commitment, your commitment, to workers. Uh, this great economy we have has created another problem in my district. People cannot find workers. And that's a problem. We need welfare reform. If you're between 18 and 65 years old, mentally and physically able to work, no children in the house, you ought to be working, right? You ought to be working. We need welfare reform. And we need immigration reform. We need more legal immigration reform. We need uh, worker visas, temporary worker visas in the ag area. So we need more workers here. And lastly, we need workforce development. You know, Mr. President, there exists a myth in this country that you cannot live the American dream unless you have a white dress shirt on and work in an office. And that, my friends, you would agree, and I think you would agree, Mr. President, is not true. Right. So the first time, the first time, my friends, in our country's history, we have more job openings, more job openings than we have workers to fill them. First time in our country's history. Hats off to you, Mr. President. So I'm confident that Mr. that Mr. President and his team and Ivanka will solve uh, our workforce problems and get more people so we can achieve what Secretary Mnuchin and I discussed over a year ago, and that is 4% economic growth. But we need the workers, and they need to be trained to do it. And I think this quarter, Mr. President, we're going to have a, a pretty good uh, GDP report. Well, on Friday, numbers come out, and I don't know what they are, but uh, there are predictions from 3.8 to 5.3. And if somebody would have said that uh, when I was running, if I would have ever even thought that. And, you know, I've been saying, uh, frankly, I've been saying we're going to do awfully well. But nobody thought we were going to be this great. We've already hit 3.2 percent. Uh, when I took over, those numbers were bad, and they were heading in the wrong direction because of regulation. No, really, the taxes were too high. People were leaving the country. Uh, companies were leaving the country. Jobs were — forget it. They were really being abandoned. And uh, other countries, frankly, were taking advantage of the United States. You know that, right? So we stopped that. But please, go ahead. Well, that, 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 that's the big points I wanted to make. And I just wanted to say, Mr. President, my parents had 10th grade educations. And I, I valued education, got an education, worked my butt off, and became uh, a self-made entrepreneur who lived the American dream. Right. And I think this is all about the American dream. 
and became one of the much. great congressmen, too, that I can tell thank you. you one much. of the most effective people in Congress. So thank you very much. Thank you. Joe, yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Um, my name's Joe Odell, and uh, I want to th thank my beautiful wife for the support out there. I want to thank the Cher family and Dubuque Screw for supporting me on my journey. Um, I was a third generation logger, and uh, in June of 2014, I was diagnosed with um, AML leukemia. Um, at that time, I was only given a few months through great um, medical miracles. I'm here today, and in that, I come back to school through NICC, and they connected me with the right people to be successful. I went through the pathway program to start out. I went through the um, one year program, and now I am into the apprenticeship program with a great company backing me. And I can tell you, I am living a very good life from this schooling. Um, this is a great program. The, the things these guys are doing to give us these opportunities is remarkable. And it's not a traditional schooling, so it's open to a lot of people that ain't real school oriented, you know. And um, there's opportunity out there. You just have to be want, want it and go get it with the drive, you know. And uh, I think with the employer support we got around our community, the community support, these people can put you in connection with the right people to make you very successful. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Georgia? Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm Georgia Van Gundy with the Iowa Business Council, and we represent 22 of the CEOs from some of the largest employers in our state, with Randy being one of them. But we have operations in all 99 counties. And I think Beth and the governor talked about our Future Ready Iowa initiative that we have, which is a statewide strategy that's the first we've ever had to address our workforce needs. And as you mentioned, we have workforce needs in this state. And so it really does take business coming to the table and leading and being collaborative and innovative. You know, our employers oftentimes do provide training programs, but as employers, we know that we have to come together and be innovative in our ways in order to attract our workforce. Um, we pledge of our members 30,000 internships, externships, and apprenticeships so that we're reaching those students early so that they understand the types of jobs that we have in the state of Iowa and why you want to stay here and why necessarily a four-year degree isn't needed to have a great career. So educating them on that. We put together a business education alliance to where we're bringing together higher education, community colleges, K through 12, and the, com and the business community to talk about innovative solutions to address our workforce. We're having collaborative industry partnerships, so bringing like industries together to say, okay, we all have these workforce needs. How can we look at apprenticeships? How can we look at different tools that are out there to address our training and workforce so that we have people here? We're having our community conversations to where we're going around the state of Iowa, where business is driving some of these conversations to really talk about what are our jobs and demand in the region? How do we start building those career pathways? How do we use some of the innovative funds that we have to provide scholarships and break down some of the barriers for people to get to employment. And then also, we're dedicated to work-based learning. We hear over and over again that if students just had the opportunity to work with businesses, to get that hands-on experience so that they know, gee, what does that algebra class get me at the end of the day? And so, as the governor mentioned, there's a work-based portal that's going to be up and running that our businesses are committed to support, and a lot of businesses are, small, medium, large, that are participating in work-based learning. And so, that's where I think the state of Iowa and all of our employers are really stepping up to engage with education so that we can, you know, our population hasn't grown in quite some time here in the state. So, it is important that we retrain the people that we have right. and fill the jobs that we have. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Job. Thanks, Georgia. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Randy Edeker. I'm the chairman, CEO, and president of Hy-Vee. Uh, just to level set about Hy-Vee, where I am. Thank you. Thank you. We are a, uh, an 86-year-old employee-owned company. We operate in eight states in the Midwest, 248 food stores, 145 C stores, 70 clinics, and 258 pharmacies. Wow. And so that's, that's who we are. Uh, I was asked just to talk about some of the, uh, the 
workforce development uh, initiatives that we've taken. Uh, in 2017, we put uh, $22 million up to develop a training and education center in Urbandale, Iowa. That's designed to enhance education of our current employees, uh, develop leadership skills. We've uh, put 2,500 of our 81,000 through that uh, and just to enhance their leadership ability and enhance skills. And then also we developed in the same year an innovation and technology center that, that employs 400 individuals. It's a 90,000 square foot facility that's very um, free flowing, collaborative type uh, center. We're using that to really engage with colleges and universities from around the Midwest. We have a, uh, right now we have a wonderful internship program with Drake University around business analytics. And so we're, we're using that as a way to develop new talent and also new ideas. Um, another area we're very proud of is our Hy-Vee Homefront. We launched Hy-Vee Homefront as a way to support uh, our vets as they're getting out of the service uh, with needs. And then it, it, it quickly turned to the opportunity to recruit. We recruited 74 vets in the last six months to Hy-Vee. We offer a $5,000 relocation bonus and then career tracking for our veterans as they get out of the service. Very important uh, part of what we do. Another area that we're exceptionally proud of is uh, the numbers of uh, opportunities we've been able to provide for individuals with disability. We've been recognized many times for what we've done. Uh, we're working with the Harkin Institute on the International Disability Employment Summit. We're, we're very active in, in employing folks with disabilities as a great part of our workforce. We actually have, uh, for the first time ever, this is a very nice, proud moment, we have the first hearing and paid license impaired licensed pharmacist in the United States who's practicing in Des Moines right now. Right. We think that's a nice thing. And then, and then finally, as a commitment, uh, we've committed to, uh, in, over the next five years, taking 800 individuals through our Hy-Vee University program, which is a, a four-year advanced program to train uh, workers and leaders in our company, 1,000 interns, 1,000 advanced skilled uh, work uh, workers will be trained and then 12,500 on the job training and uh, working with individuals to learn new skills to assimilate into our companies and others. And so we've committed to uh, 15,000 uh, training opportunities over the next five years as a part of uh, your pledge today. And right. so once again, thank you for having us Good. here. You thank bet. you, Randy. You thank you very much. Thank you very much. How about you, Matt? Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Matt Drowski and I reside here in the town of Piasta. Here with me today is my lovely wife, Monica, uh, my two brothers, and both my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> I am honored to be here to talk briefly about the opportunity my employer, Service One, has given me to participate in the HVAC apprenticeship program through the CEU Authority. After high school, I attended Southwest Tech for dairy herd management, and then eventually NICC for HVAC. I was offered a position at a company graduating where I was a uh, low man on the totem pole doing grunt work. I moved on to Service One because they offered me the chance to grow uh, through the apprenticeship program. And because of the opportunity Service One has provided me, like the apprenticeship program, I am now running service calls on my own. And I am now a third year apprentice and will be soon a licensed journeyman. This program has allowed me. <laughs> This program has allowed me to build on my skills and knowledge in the trade that seems to be declining in the workforce for skilled laborers. It is allowing me to better myself and become a greater asset to my employer and to the industry. My brother, who is here today, is, has followed into my footsteps at Service One and will be starting an apprenticeship next year. Uh, Mr. President, I want to thank you and congratulate you for the effort in helping the working class and believing in American workers with the workforce development. I believe this will give the opportunity or give the other options to kids like myself and my brother who may not fit the college mode. Thank you again for allowing me to share today. It's been a real honor. Thank you very much. Matt. Beautiful job. Beautiful. 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 Please. Mr. President, thanks for being here and welcome. Um, I'm Matt Geezy, uh, project manager at Geezy Sheet Metal. Uh, our family has a three businesses here in town, um, been in business 95 years and family owned and operated since the start. So that's 
not a lot of people do that. So, you know, we're, we're proud of that very much so. Um, you know, great grandpa started in the alley selling furnaces and sheet metal, and now we got, you know, three locations and 150 employees. So each generation's made right. it better and better, and so hopefully ours is, you know, good. <laughs> so No doubt. No doubt. And actually, uh, our vice president was at our Gizi Manufacturing a couple months before the election, and it was probably the best rally of the entire summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Kim and Rod, because, you know, we had a huge stainless steel metal sign, Trump out of, you know, Trump pants. It was, yeah, nice. <laughs> we, 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 yeah, they, they join us often, so. Um, but I work on the construction side of things, so I estimate and do uh, commercial HVAC and duct work. Um, I can tell you the jobs are out there, um, you know, seeing great numbers. And that not just us. I mean, everybody is seeing they're busier than the, you know, don't know what to do. I, we're so busy that we got guys on mandatory overtime. And they're great guys. I just want more of them, you know. Um, and, I, and it's not just us. It's all the trades that need, need more guys. Um, you know, and I actually saw a guy while we were waiting. He had a sign that says always hiring. And I think that's a good sign because, you know, you can always better yourself, you know, regardless. But, um, yeah. Um, and then I echo, like Rod and a few of the others have said, that for the longest time you heard the only way you're going to make money is go to college, go to college. And for so long, the, the trades kind of went by the wayside. And I, I don't, I, you realize, but a lot of folks don't realize how much good money it is. I mean, some of these are $60,000 a year plus jobs. And so, and plus no college debt. And I think that's something that gets lost as well. Um, so NICC does a great job. We've got some good guys out of here. You know, with what the governor's doing, I think we're definitely on the right step. Um, so I think we just keep going. Um, I think bottom line is the work's there. We just need the bodies to do it. So, um, but thanks again for letting me be a part of this. Thank you very much. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Wendy? Welcome, Mr. President and Ivanka. I'm Wendy Knight, and it is my pleasure on behalf of all of our vice presidents, all of our faculty and staff, to welcome you to the greatest community college in the nation. <laughs> and I hope this is acceptable with my Secret Service security friends. Uh, for those of you in the audience, if you partner with us, if you had a student who you have hired if you have a friend, a relative, anyone you know that has been touched by NICC, please raise your hand. Yeah. Wow. 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 It is because of you that we are the greatest community college. So thank you very much. I get to share with you hopes and dreams. You're going to hear some themes here with the stories I'm going to share. Students who attend our community college for in-demand training, receive a very high return on investment. Ashley Potterbaum lost her customer service job. She was a single mom. She needed a career with a self-sustaining income to care for her daughter. She enrolled here at Northeast Iowa Community College in our gas utility diploma program. And in only nine months' time, and right before she was going to graduate, she was offered a job by one of our utility companies full time and now making over $26 an hour. Awesome. Okay. Melissa Oliveris, you met today. She attended Luther College on a music scholarship with a dream to play soccer. Melissa sustained an injury that sidelined that athletic career. She decided to return to Dubuque. She was looking for a mix of creativity, problem solving, and hands-on work that would truly make a difference and impact the world she lives. She found that at Northeast Iowa Community College in our engineering technology program. She loved that the college offered one-on-one -on -one instruction and that everyone wanted her to be successful. And a shout out to our John Deere friends. I believe she's interviewing with you next week. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My last story you also met today, Nancy Seckinger. After several part-time jobs with a temp agency, 
she returned to her home state of Iowa. She enrolled in our engineering technology two-year program. Nancy attributes her success to the amazing faculty and many resources at Northeast Iowa Community College. Nancy is a little bit of an overachiever. She has also a welding degree and she worked as a journeyman pipe fitter for 10 years. Today, she works at our great city or our great business here in Dubuque, Iowa, DDI. Thank you, President Thank Trump. Thank you very and much, Thank you. Thank you. Our great Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, who was a big, big success on Wall Street. And I said, you have to bring some successful people in, especially for that job. We'll be doing great. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to talk about the biggest unused resource we have in this country. We think about resources as farmland or, nat or min mineral land or oil and natural gas land. The biggest unused resource is people who've been sidelined because they don't have the skills. Labor force participation for the prime age workers, namely those 25 to 54, is 82 percent, but even that is two points below the peak that was back in 1999. That's two and a half million more Americans who would be at work just to get back to the old percentage. That would mean $125 billion more salary. It's a huge, huge increment. Worse yet is the 16 to 24 age group. Their participation rate is only 55.4%, down 14 percentage points from the peak in 1989. That means there are more than 5 million young Americans who could be in the workforce but don't have the skills. But the jobs are there. That could be another 125 billion of salaries. So those two alone would be a quarter of a trillion dollars more pay for Americans. Think what that would mean for the economy. Think what it would mean for the families. Think what it would mean for everybody. That's Thank what you. we're after yep. with Ivanka and President Trump's program. That's right. Thank you, Wilbur. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to call out a friend of mine who's in the audience, Jeff Kaufman. Stand up, Jeff. He led the Republican Party to a great victory in the state of Iowa. Thank you, Jeff. And I hear we're doing well. We're doing well? That's good. You are fantastic. Thank you very much. I just look up. I see Jeff sitting there. But he's totally political, so. <laughs> great job you do. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Acosta, so he has turned out to be uh, one of our greats. I told you about health care. He came out of nowhere with this incredible plan, and he's done a fantastic job as the Secretary of Labor. Please, Alex. Mr. President, thank you. you know, as, um, as I've been listening to, to the comments around the table, I'm struck by how many firsts we have seen over the past several months. The tax cut that the President referenced is the biggest tax cut that we have seen in decades, maybe ever. And what does that mean? That means initially we saw 2 million, then 3 million, and last I saw 6 million Americans had received a bonus or a salary increase or some other dividend directly because of the tax cuts. I was. Uh, I was at a facility, advanced manufacturing facility last week, signing one of the Pledge to American Workers with the CEO of that facility. And after the tax cuts, they put aside $100 million to help train and educate their workforce. Think about that. And they said that was because of the tax cuts at first. Deregulation. You've heard the President reference 22 to 1. When have we ever seen an administration that rolls back so many regulations so quickly? Veterans Administration, reform. And so what does this mean? If you look at our economy, it is strong. The unemployment rates are the lowest we've seen 
in my lifetime, quite literally. The initial jobless claims that recently came out were the lowest since 1969. The unemployment rate here in Iowa is 2.7%. Think about that. And GDP, when the president was running, they said 3% was impossible. But we've seen 3%. And then when we saw 3%, they said 4% is impossible. Yet today, we're talking about 4% GDP, perhaps, tomorrow. And, and here's another first. You heard the numbers from your congressman. There are more job openings in the economy today than there are people looking for jobs. So the Department of Labor puts out these job numbers. And since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started keeping this data, we have never had an economy where we have more job openings than we have people looking for jobs. Talk about a great first. Our problem isn't where are the jobs. Our problem is where are the skilled people to fill those jobs. And that's a great problem to have. And that leads me to another first, the Perkins CTE. You, had the pre you heard the president say, that folks have been trying to do this since 2006. And so Ivanka Trump got together with Chairman Alexander and with Chairwoman Fox in the House. And yesterday, it was passed by voice vote. Imagine that, by voice vote. They just wanted to move it and get it done. And that's going to be transformative, because what that means, and you heard from your community college president, that means support for all these community colleges that are working to provide, and I loved, I loved your phrase, phrase Wendy, in-demand skills. We call it demand-driven education. Education where community colleges respond to what is being demanded by businesses. They teach not just any old skill, but in-demand skills. And that's what this initiative, this Pledge to American Workers, is about. So last week in the White House, we saw almost, we saw companies make commitments to provide educational opportunities and apprenticeships to almost four million American workers. And today I was handed this when I walked in. Here in Iowa, because of the governor's work, businesses have come together. You heard from hy V and you just heard from Randy and some others. Businesses have come together and they've already pledged 50,000 training opportunities because of Governor Reynolds' work to Iowans. And that's transformative to each and every one of those jobs. And we're just getting started. And so the point that I want to make is a very simple one. Whether it's through tax cuts, through deregulation, through job opportunities for individuals that are looking to transition careers, through educational opportunities for community colleges, through the Perkins CTE, for veterans that are looking for quality health care, through association health plans, the rules that we just proposed that are going to drop health care costs for associations around the nation. And I know here, I heard this morning that some groups in Iowa are already putting those associations together. That is impacting lives. Those aren't just theories. That is impacting American lives across this nation. And it's pretty incredible that that has happened in, in essence, about a year and a half. And so I just wanted to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, very much. Thank you. And just to go on a little bit from what uh, Alex said, uh, we have to keep it going. And we can't have people uh, ending the tax cuts and giving you massive tax increases, which is what the Democrats want to do. We can't have people with open borders where people flow into our country. Many of these people are not people that we can have in our country. We can't get rid of ICE, who are the bravest, toughest people you'll ever meet. And they handle the situation. These are uh, people that are so brave that, uh, you know, it's, it's brilliant to see what they do. And yet, uh, they're disrespected by large, large portions of the Democrats. We can't lose ICE. That's our protection. They're fair, but they're tough. And that's all that 
the other side really understands, especially when you're dealing with people like MS-13 gangs. These are the toughest people, but they're not as tough as what we have, not even close. And they understand that, and they respect it. In their own way, they respect it. So we have to keep it going. We don't want to have our tax cuts, and they're very, very substantial. We don't want to have that ended. We don't want to have tax increases that will kill the whole thing. We want to keep all of our programs going. We don't want them ended. So that's why I mentioned Rod and, and uh, Kim and the people that, uh, that have represented your state on our side of the ledger. I mean, the fact is they've done an incredible job, and it's only going to get better. If we keep this, uh, this incredible phenomena going, it will only get better. Our numbers are fantastic right now. You're going to see on Friday what happens with, with GDP. Uh, a lot of predictions, a lot of predictions. I told you before, some with a five in front of it. It would have been, uh, to mention that would have been, uh, you would have driven these people back there crazy. <laughs> and it could be very close. Could even happen. 5.3, somebody said yesterday. One of the geniuses on Wall Street said 5.3. Okay, we'll take anything with a four in front. We'll go nice and slowly, right? But uh, I, I just want to say it's so important to keep it going. So, uh, Rod, I appreciate you being here and really appreciate the job you've done. You love these people. It is true. I said, I said a flood wall. How much is a flood wall going to cost? $117 million. I said, Rod, what are you talking about? $117 million? He got it. <laughs> Very few people would have gotten that, believe me. So, uh, congratulate. Use it well, right? Use it well in Iowa. And, Kim, uh, maybe I'm going to let you finish off, uh, but I really appreciate the job you're doing. I'm very proud of you because, in a sense, I feel a little bit responsible because I took your other great governor <laughs> and I sent him to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're all about holding the people accountable, and I can guarantee you that Ambassador Branstad is holding me accountable as well. Sure. He has a great legacy, and I want to continue to build on that. I just want to reiterate again how proud we are to have you in the state. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank I you. appreciate the partnership, and especially the flexibility that you are giving to the states to give us the opportunity to take these programs and take the resources to be held accountable for, but really to accent the great the great programs that we have going on. So when I talk to businesses uh, all across the state, I ask them how business is going, and they say it's never been better. They're projecting growth, significant growth, and so that's a result of some of the policies that you've put in place, and we're extremely appreciative of that, much. and we're going to continue to build on thank that you. from the state of Iowa. So thank you for being here and being thank a you. part of this. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Here, Kim, take another time, all right? Thank you. Jeff, come here, Jeff. Jeff, you give us a minute.